it's very nice to be here. And it's very nice to see so many new faces and uh, quite a few old trends. Uh, in this talk, if you were to take one takeaway from this talk, it would be that whenever the company grows, whenever it needs change, whenever it scales, things, tools, and models that are required to scale the company change. So if there are some domain patterns at one stage of the life of the company, they might not work at different stages. So you need to continuously brainstorm, explore, seek out, and try and experiment. So that's one thing I hope you'll remember. The rest is not that interesting. So I'll be talking about the retail domain. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about the context, technology, things involved, there is a story on my blog post that I've been running since 2014. So for the technical details and some of the thought process and dev processes, you can go there and check it out. Uh, so I'll be talking or retrospecting or like trying to figure out things that we did at one specific company called Skewalt, which provides online warehouse management solutions. It is essentially a software where you can run your warehouse uh, selling stuff on Amazon, on whatever, eBay. Uh, when the orders come in, you fulfill them by picking stuff from the warehouse, and you refill the warehouse by sending out requests to buy stuff and click, uh, adding things to the warehouse when they come in. So that's the domain that we'll be talking about. And that's current state of the things that we have in the company, just to give you a sense of the scale. So that was a secure event sourcing based solution. Uh, at the moment, we have 450 different event types, and the number of events keeps on growing as we're adding new features, as we're enabling new capabilities for the customers. Because in this market, you have to be moving fast and you have to be evolving and trading. Uh, since this company is an event sourcing based solution, we're storing every single event that happened with our customers since the beginning of their lifetime. So at this moment, we have almost half a terabyte, 400 gigabytes of events in protobuf format. If it was in JSON, it would be larger. Uh, 1.5 billion events in store, and it keeps on growing. Uh, to present with infrastructural scale, so we have different server types, 16 of them, that are playing a major part of production. And obviously, there are multiple instances of each server for high availability. And on the organizational side, that's two countries, developers from two countries, and additionally, remote workers are working on this domain. So this brings additional complexity. And one more factor that affects complexity of the domain is the load. It's the performance requirements. That's the typical chart of the number of sales per day that were registered in the company, in this software, since the beginning of time. And as you can see, it's growing. What's more interesting, there are spikes, which are related to Black Friday, which means that Amazon and other major retailers are announcing huge discounts before the Christmas season. And people are rushing to buy more stuff, for their pre more presents, for their loved ones for their families, and this results in increased load. Usually it's like four to five more times events are coming in. So that's, these are the constraints. These are complexity constraints that were affecting how the domain was evolving. And that's the idea I borrowed from Alberto, using Legos as illustrations for the domain complexity. And we've been talking about three distinct phases uh, of lifetime of company and related domain model that can be identified in retrospective. Two on the top are the ones that we've passed, and the third one is the one in thinking. And I might be saying some crazy things. OK, so this company, like pretty much any other startup, uh, it is born at some period of time. The business is launched. And whenever you launch a business, you 
as we found out, need to be able to iterate fast on your domain model, need to be able to iterate efficiently, deliver. Essentially, you need to deliver value to your customers to gain their trust, and then iterate quickly to build upon that trust. And there were a few things that helped us to grow and scale the domain at this phase. First one, cloud services. I'm sure there will be multiple people mentioning them uh, at this conference. In essence, cloud services are when cloud vendors take good care of your websites, of your services. They make sure that you can run, that you can scale, and that you're very flexible. This comes with the drawbacks. But for the companies that are starting, cloud services provide great opportunity to experiment, to experiment with their domain, how domain models are mapped to the infrastructure, how they are scaled, how they run. Second thing that is probably quite familiar to quite a few people here, so who knows about the aggregates? Just show of hands. Who knows about aggregates with event sourcing? And who has done aggregates with event sourcing? Okay, quite a few people. So yes, that's what we've been doing as well. We're doing aggregates with event sourcing in this company since the very beginning. Too quick, oops, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not able to keep up with this phase. Uh, so we're doing aggregates with event sourcing, which is a simple system where your business logic, which runs behind the web UI, native UI, whatever, uh, it accepts actions or commands in other way, or API requests. Uh, it Whenever it has to persist and change, it emits an event to the distributed commit log or to local commit log, it doesn't matter. And these events describe state transitions, the main important state transitions in the system. In our case, that could be the history log of a single tenant, of a single customer. Tenant created, user added, product created, location added. Usual basic stuff. And as we've learned later, starting to use starting to model your domain with this specific pattern, it helped a lot to scale the company later when we were facing uh, new challenges. First of all, because domain events, they model reality in a nice way. They, stay true to the they can stay true with the reality for a long time, thus keeping the domain model, which is based on them, in sync with reality for longer. Uh, it is easier for developers to pick up the real understanding of the business, and it is easier for the business to stay aligned with events. And as we'll see later, they had a lot of nice benefits as well, other nice benefits. Another thing that worked quite so well in this project in the beginning were value objects. In other words, value objects are domain primitives, uh, which allow you to encapsulate some of the domain behaviors or expectations. Uh, and this is example of the most popular and the most important domain primitive in the system, cell ID. And you can express the requirements of the specific domain primitive only once, and every new developer that will be joining the code base, that will be working with the code base, will have automatically these rules enforced upon his code. It helped to bring new developers, it helped to scale uh, the domain to some limit uh, in complexity, in adding new behaviors, and in adding new people. And in the end, we ended up with this pretty classical design, SecureS, uh, where we have a UI or API, which sends commands to the engine, which runs multiple services. Uh, as a side effect, or as a primary effect, these services publish events which are committed to the event store or distributed commit log. In your case, it would be Greg's event store, Kafka, doesn't really matter. And there are a bunch of projection services which are long-running processes or long-running event handlers which subscribe to the interesting events and when they receive them, they change the state of the database, regenerating or updating materialized views which are used by the clients. Classical architecture, as it turned out, it helped to scale this company or the software behind the company in the initial phases quite nicely. Simply because uh, in some businesses, most of the functionality can be derived by adding new read models, by adding new reports, by adding new exports, by introducing new columns on the grids, because customers like that. 
And in this decoupled design, this was done by simply introducing new projections, new views, and hooking up them to the web UI. So this helped to scale the complexity and gain more customers by introducing new features they wanted and helped to move the company forward. What also helped to scale the design at this phase was the introduction of bounded contexts the way we they were understood at that time. And each of these small boxes was a bounded context, which inside was running a full SecureS model. This meant that different parts of the system could be deployed uh, independently, that they could be developed and versioned independently, and they could be somewhat scaled independently by requesting a larger instance on the cloud. So that's a very simple design, which helped which enabled the company to grow a little bit. I think it was, to, the company grew to 10 developers. Uh, there was quite a nice business. So we were scaling. At this point, we started hitting limitations. Limitations meaning that there were new bottlenecks. There were new constraints that didn't really matter to us before. But as the domain evolved, this, we started hitting them hard. And it was nice to recognize them, although some things were recognized only in retrospective. First and foremost, cloud services. Cloud services are like hotels. They can take very good care of you. And we used that good care to a great extent. For example, our view storage was in Azure Blob Storage, which can scale almost indefinitely, horizontally. You can keep on adding more views. You can have thousands or millions of your objects. That works perfectly, and it was utilized to the max. But then when we started uh, ramping up the computational capacities, we started paying the cost of these virtual machines, of redundancy, and we started getting large bills. That's a bill of uh, a hotel, but ours were comparable, if not larger. The second part. This design inherently had some scalability limitations. If you have a single event bus, then you might be bottlenecked at how fast you can push to it, especially if you have a replicated event bus, bus since you want to be able to scale out your system. Uh, not scale out, in, uh, in case you want to provide services of your system, even some, if some of the node goes down. That can become a bottleneck. If you have a limited number of projection engines running in your system, they can become a bottleneck when the business grows. And if you're actually using patterns from domain-driven design, patterns from event sourcing, event storming, event modeling, you're bound or you're more likely to create a successful business. And successful business means more customers coming in. And you're also helping existing customers to grow their business, which means, again, more load for you. So we started hitting scalability limits. Additionally, the design initially was a monolith. Or to be precise, we had like six or seven monoliths. And in the beginning, that was a very good thing. Because developers didn't have to go through a lot of abstractions. They had their domain model, for example, for products, or domain model for sales. And when they needed to change something, some, to add some behavior that touches multiple parts of this bounded context, they were able to do that without much effort. But this started creating problems because monoliths are harder to scale, especially if you want to have them elastically scalable while staying highly available. So the design and thinking about the company and the software started moving to a new direction. So we switched to event-driven services. That's maybe quite similar to the aggregates that were done before. But let's recap the important parts. A service. It can be considered a black box. Previously, we knew exactly what's going, what was going inside the service. Aggregate with event sourcing. And the service was calling these aggregates. Later on, we realized that aggregates with event sourcing as a way of thinking about the code and way of aligning your code with the reality was constraining 
because it was limiting us to certain code patterns. And these code patterns didn't play well with scalability or didn't stick with the, how you design a distributed system. So we started thinking about our services as black boxes that receive API requests and that reply to them. So it's pretty much the same like before, but without the aggregates. And the service that publishes to the distributed commit log, subscribe to that commit, distributed commit log, it became the basic building block of the design in the two. So no aggregates anymore. However, with this building block, you can build, as we've learned, uh, quite a lot of different designs. And this, uh, this slight change in thinking allows you to scale both in performance, in, in load, and in design complexity. Quick example. So let's say we have a service that publishes to the commit log. And this commit log is highly available and distributed. This means that we can start adding more complexity to our domain, adding more features to our product by setting up a new box outside of the picture and making sure it simply subscribes to the, to the commit log and publishes to that commit log. We can add, for example, reporting module, which contains completely new reports like data mining analytics. That is mostly a set of read models that subscribe to the commit log and serve the use or serve API requests. And what's important, this can be done independently. This will not affect existing systems. Or in terms of scaling not only the complexity, but the performance, you could set up a bunch of replicas of the same service serving read requests. They'll be completely similar to each other, but maybe they'll be living in different data centers or in different locations. And the load balancer or DNS routing or whatever mechanism you use will tell the customers which server to use. So using a commit log and multiplexing events that are delivered to multiple servers is a simple way to scale your system. But not only technically can we scale this approach. Uh, when you have a single commit log, which is populated by the events, and the main events, they stay true to their nature for a long time, because the business doesn't evolve that fast around them. Uh, this means that you can use events that go to the commit log as domain interchange context, as a language of the company, language of the business, and you can organize your teams around that. You can have multiple teams working uh, on different features in parallel, managed by different QA teams, uh, by different project managers, and maybe working even in different languages in parallel. So this approach makes it easier to scale organizations. So, well, uh, slides with a lot of text are boring. Uh, let's move forward. And that actually uh, was the approach that also helped us to migrate and to develop new features. Because at some points, you can scale your domain by introducing more capabilities, more features, only by error rewrite. Maybe because you made a lot of mistakes, you have to admit them, and you have to rewrite your domain. Not like all at once, because business is evolving and you can just shut down the business and create a new version which will be outdated by the moment it's finished. But you can do a gradual rewrite. And that's what was done here. So the first version was publishing to a commit log. And then new versions of services uh, with maybe with their own UI started being plugged into the same commit bus, oh sorry, uh, into the same commit log. And they were talking. Sometimes they were talking between the versions. So new versions of the services that maybe were more scalable or more aligned with the design, with more aligned with the uh, domain model, were working together with the older versions. This allowed to scale further. Another thing that enabled evolution of the system and adding more features and scaling the domain, domain implementation, both in complexity uh, or features being captured and performance or specifications. Uh, this is a picture from the patent uh, that was filed for the Lego building blocks. 
it specifies exactly how the building blocks look on the outside. What are the dimensions? Uh, how do they have to, which dimension do they need to have in order to fit precisely to each other? What are their concepts about them? Note that it doesn't say a word about what's inside these building blocks, at least this picture. It doesn't say which plastic they have used, which molding process they have used to deliver these building blocks. It's just the outside, the only thing that matters. And if the Lego company switched from, I don't know, the classical molding to 3D printing or even, I don't know, quantum multiplication, these building blocks will still be compatible with existing sets because they're the same on the outside. And that's what we try to model in the domain as well. So let's take a look at the service again. It's a big black box. It, has, it can accept API requests. It obviously has to reply to these API requests. Uh, also, it listens to the events. It, it publishes to these events. And if we were able to describe combinations of these behaviors in a way that is more or less exhaustive, not exhaustive, but good enough to capture all the important behaviors, and if we were completely to swap the service with some other language, I don't know, quantum computing, uh, three-bit computing, but the specifications remain the same, then the software would still work. Because if we expect to see a duck, and if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, who cares what's inside? And so that was probably one of the most helpful as uh, seen by developers in retrospective we ended up with specifications. And probably the top line is not visible here, but it doesn't really matter, it's the name of specification. So specification is a data structure that is essentially a given when then test. It says that given some events that happened in the past, when we execute a specific API request, then we expect a specific API response, and maybe some other events are published as a side effect. Uh, and what's important here is that our expectations of the behavior, they're not precise. We might be getting a huge JSON with, uh, that has lots of lots of fields, but in this specification, we're checking only a bunch of fields in a simple nested structure because other fields might be relating to a different feature. And this simple approach, it enabled hidden personas. Introduction of specifications that capture behavior of the backend API, it enabled uh, people to have two different persona. The design persona and the developer persona, which is very good at op optimizing and writing code. So what developers started doing, uh, the backend developers, because that's where the most complexity laid at this point. Uh, when they received requirements from the UI team or uh, from the business analysts, they started writing the specifications that were supposed to be implemented. Like, given that we had these events in the past, when there is an API request to search for sales with these filters, then I'll get this API response. <coughs> or, given that I have these sales in the system, when a user tries to start picking them in the warehouse, this is the response that I give him in the API, or this is the relevant part of the response that I give him, and these are the events that get published. So introduction of specifications that captured the essence of the behavior without actually being coupled to the implementation. It empowered developers, it made it easier for them first to work in one mode when they design the API, and then they were able to switch to the implementation mode where they were worrying only about how things should go, how many requests to the database you do, uh, how efficiently you pass the data through about, once again, because uh, the performance was critical in that domain. Or this could be completely to different people. Uh, a guy with good experience about API context uh, and what is needed to, for the UI could design the specifications and the other guy could implement them. And this approach enabled to take complex business requirements and decompose them into fairly simple edge case, uh, use cases or specifications or tests, whatever. 
so for instance, for a group of features, we could have a bunch of specifications that describe the primary behavior that were uh, written initially. Then we could have an edge cases that appeared or were discovered when the developer was working with the UI team. And then we have regressions, all covered nicely. And that's where, that's when the developers started doing real test-driven development. Uh, in fact, they got used to that approach that they weren't even running the entire engine anymore. Most of the time was spent in writing specifications, making sure that the engine runs, oh sorry, that, they're, that they validate the business logic correctly, and they would switch to the other one. What we discovered also at some point later was that these specifications allowed to scale the domain by refactoring the complex parts. Because if you take, for instance, two services, two black boxes on the, back, on the bottom, sorry, top, and you can see that some of the services have specifications of the same color. Maybe they talk to related database entries, or maybe they carry out similar functionality, and you want to refactor. But maybe you're afraid that you'll break everything because there are so many optimizations, performance thingies, or domain details inside. Well, if you have specifications that cover the behaviors, who cares? You just take, you rearrange the specifications into modules as you need it, and then you iterate quickly till you get the results out, till you get working implementation. And at this point, we start realizing that our tests, these kind of tests, they are precious. In fact, we felt that if we were to take away the domain implementation, which contained a lot of performance optimizations, a lot of man hours, throw them completely away, and if we only had the specifications at hand, then we'd be able to write the entire domain implementation in, about, in a couple of months. Guess what? That's what happened. What we did uh, at this project, we completely rewrote the backend engine multiple times to make sure that it is able to cope with new features, new requirements, and what's more important, What's more important, scalability requirements. So initially it started as in-memory implementation. That was very fast to iterate, but for some reason this in-memory implementation tended to lose the data upon reboot a couple of times per week. So we switched to Cassandra, then we needed to have some specific uh, search queries being served more efficiently than Cassandra could. So we went to Cassandra with Lucene, then Cassandra with Elastic, then back with Cassandra, because Cassandra with Lucene tends to crash the entire cluster of nodes. And then we ended up with a completely weird choice, which is Lightning Memory Map Database. Uh, this might be a weird choice for other companies, but for this specific case, this database matched the domain perfectly. It matched better than the other options. Being able to find this sweet spot, it enabled uh, to the company to grow further and be a able to serve more customers and grow the domain. Okay, that's the guy who created the da database. Uh, if you're interested, I'll tell more, uh, much more about this database and how awesome it is. Uh, in essence, it's just a simple file that is mapped to the memory that can serve very fast reads. It uh, can scale right. It can't scale writes because it is one uh, single thread, but it can scale reads. Not that important. What's more important, what was more important for our domain, is that with this database, we're finally able to replay billions of events, all billions of events, well, one billion of events, on a single node in 12 hours. It's like handle 12,000 events on a single, uh, sorry, billion of events on a single node in one thread, I believe in 12 hours. That was important for the domain. Uh, it was important that you were able to scale out uh, to get more efficiency and ability to serve customers for each dollar. And actually, it was also more important because with that approach, we were able to start testing our domain at the speed of 100 to 600 tests per second on a single thread, or maybe two threads. This meant that the developer were able to verify very efficiently that his domain implementation is stays in sync with the requirements. This had a side effect. Since we are so efficient and we have such a good tool that allows us to make sure that our domain 
model is in sync with the domain implementation, uh, we no longer needed the artifacts in the code that helped us to keep aligned before. Before we had aggregates, before we had value objects, and all the other details that didn't scale so well with complexity. It, we were able to start ditching them because we have other ways at this point to enforce the alignment between the domain model as it is understood and the domain implementation. And uh, there were a few small things that helped to scale the uh, domain complexity or impl implementational complexity uh, of the domain as the company and the software grew. And I just want to list them for the reference because they have the D letter. Uh, that was one of the things. So it's LMDB specific domain specific language. It was just a 500 lines of Lisp code that enabled us to write uh, our specifications for the database layer. Uh, as you see, LMDB database is similar to LevelDB or RocksDB or HyperDB or HyperLevel, I don't remember exactly, uh, in API. They allow you to store bytes uh, by bytes. So essentially, it's dictionary of bytes mapped to bytes. And the keys are sorted in lexicogra lexicographical order. That's very nice. However, our developers didn't want to bother with bytes when we were, they were implementing the main model. They wanted to save sales. They wanted to add items to the sales. Maybe they wanted to search products by their ID. So we introduced a DSL that took specifications like that. In this case, for instance, we're declaring that we have a virtual table called inventory that have keys aligned with the domain aliases, tenant ID, product ID, warehouse ID, location code, container ID, and that has a bunch of values and that supports a bunch of operations on these values. So developers, while implementing their uh, required functionality, were able to write quickly schemas like that, and each line in that schema translates to a boring code like this. Uh, here it just says that uh, given a transaction, ten tidy in some other stuff, you perform some operations, and while also tracking, keeping track of timing and performance. It doesn't really matter because we have lots of lots of this code. It's always up to date, it's exact, it's precise, it almost never has bugs. We never touched the DSL part since it was written. It just works. And in fact, uh, DSL as a pattern, if you may, as a programming pattern, that helps to scale uh, the software and developer productivity. Uh, was also present in other parts of the software, like creating the contracts. For instance, this is a contract for the command. Events would be the same. That says that includes some invariants and says that we need to declare an object, and we don't want to uh, worry about writing proper constructors, uh, properties, or serialization attributes. And this would translate into this, or generated by the code. So DSLs worked quite nicely for the domain. It helped to scale the developer productivity and take away the boring parts. In fact, it, uh, at that point, we liked the DSL so much that the long-term plan was to introduce even more DSLs to make sure that developers write the code that is more aligned with the domain, while uh, the compiler takes care of aligning that with the machine-readable machine, machine readable code. And at that point, we started hitting new limitations. That's probably quite frequent in the software world that when a company grows to 50, 40 people, there is a new barrier. There is a complexity barrier because you have uh, so many people and you need to add a new organizational level of complexity. Uh, and existing startup, startup ish or lean processes don't work anymore. You need to formalize that organization. And that's where uh, the Conway law starts striking. So we started facing these issues as well. And I'll talk about the challenges, possible solutions. And while talking about the possible solution, I uh, just want to clear, make it clear upfront that it is 
not a solution that actually works already in production. It's something that is being designed, and it might or might not work. But it certainly has the same feel to it that we had when we were designing specifications for the V2. So the challenges that the successful software uh, with successful business faced at the point uh, where it's hit its next road block were cluster management. So we had so many servers, we had so many different types of machines with different services and replicas uh, that two dedicated DevOps people uh, with the help of the cloud uh, weren't enough. Well, they aren't enough and we need to scale. So uh, one of the things would be probably like trying something like Kubernetes, uh, running on hosted dedicated hardware for, to optimize that performance and cost. The second part that became a huge problem and it's more related to the domain, value objects. Value objects are nice when you have a single domain or a single code base or two code bases, like the backend and the web UI, especially if a web UI is served by something like ASP.NET. However, if your business grows, chances are that the customers will start requesting new platforms or new specific implementations. For instance, a customer might want to have an Android device hooked on his machine, or sorry, hooked in his warehouse, or God forbid, Windows Compact Edition, because some barcode scanners uh, are integrated with that. And that's where the problem of value objects starts striking. So let's take a simple, very simple example, sale ID, which is a value object which, co which contains some rules that we want to enforce about this string or string and enumeral, in a, uh, a num. And all works good, but when you, have, when you use this value object in your client, web client, Android, Apple, etc., etc., you have this coupling between them because that's a single instance or a single uh, domain primitive that exists in multiple code bases. And what if you want to make a change? What if you have a customer that needs to have a special character in, uh, in the sale ID and the customer is big enough to justify that change because you'll make so much money from it? Then you need to actually go into all these code bases and you need to make changes everywhere. What's more importantly, uh, when you make the changes, you need to coordinate multiple teams working on that. And these teams might have different plans and release schedules. So while you make this fairly trivial change, uh, you need to make sure that the API release is coordinated with the rollout of the new features. And for instance, if uh, Apple Store requires certain validation period, you need to roll out the API, then wait for them to approve, and then only afterwards, when the number of users using that platform drop, or old API drops, you can uh, get rid of the old API. So that's complexity. That's not nice. And when you have this unnatural coupling between the different uh, code bases, which exist in different languages, because you have to work for, for different platforms, but contain implementation of the same domain model, you get code amplifications. That's Chinese typewriter. It's just uh, to illustrate the fact that you have to do a lot of things, maybe to write. In a uh, case of developers, they had to do a lot of changes. They had to write a lot of code to make a simple change. Like this wasn't bef like this before when the company was starting. When you wanted to change your value object or introduce a small feature, uh, you didn't have to do much work. You just could hack it away and in an hour the feature was rolled out. As the company grew, as the processes expanded, as organizational complexity increased, as the scalability requirements increased, suddenly the level of rituals you had to carry out increased dramatically. You had to talk to other teams to make sure that changes work out. And for instance, previously in the basic uh, organizational layout, when you have a big feature that is coming from a customer and it's going to make a lot of money for the company, uh, it's probably business analysts would take on it. Uh, 
they would write user stories, they would specify what has to be done, maybe they'll mock the UI, then it will be passed to the web team, which will write the new implementation, like new part of the single page application. And while doing that, they'll probably will reuse parts of the API and also pass out requests to the backend team saying, okay, we need this API or we need this field on the API. QA will test this stuff, project managers will manage, DevOps will deploy. Works nicely. Not if the organizational complexity increases. What if you have multiple platforms and you need to roll out a new feature in all of them? Like, where do you start? Because you need to touch everything. So what if, and that's where the speculative part starts, what if the entire, we got the entire domain model wrong? What if we got the boundaries wrong? What if, like, the acknowledged, the established way of building domain-driven, secure-driven, event-sourcing-driven applications that we have this day, single-page application that talks to the API, was completely wrong? What if we were able to apply the inverse Conway maneuver, it is, uh, or I guess, already called, and to refactor our understanding of the domain, refactor our own boundaries to solve people problems, like apply new design patterns to improve the organization. So let's take a look at the thing that the customers see. Because customers are paying money not for the domain, the domain value objects. They're not playing, paying money for the events. They don't care how many machines are running in the back end. They don't care about the nice performance improvements. What they care about this. This is their gateway, uh, the tool they use to solve their problems. So customers care about the UI. All the stuff below, the back end is irre irrelevant. They don't care. And when you work with the designers, when you work with web developers, you start noticing that there is domain language there that was pretty much ignored for a long time. So take a look here. We have a single page application. It has a menu. It has navbar on the left. It has breadcrumbs. It has sales search panel, which has a bunch of different filters that don't have meaning for other projects or maybe even other uh, UI types. We have user filter, date filter, location filter, or warehouse filter. And when the search is performed, we have sales summary bar, and what's below but completely out is sale availability grid. And the black box at the bottom, the sale availability grid, is actually a component composed from other subcomponents. People that uh, are doing web development these days they would probably recognize that there is a pattern that repeated itself all over again in the React development. Because you compose UI out of a set of reusable components. Or rather, when you develop your web UI or native UI, uh, you decompose your UI into the reusable components, which bear domain names, which bear alignment with specific language. And this language isn't in the domain model, usually because we're dealing in the back end with events, commands, actions. There's nothing, stuff like that later. So maybe we get something wrong. And maybe if there is something coupled, maybe there is a link, some alignment. So what, what if the boundaries are wrong? What if the mere fact that changing a value object in the service layer, service layer in the back end requires same change in the client UI, what if it means that these are the same things or tightly related things? And as you can see, so we have users that talk to the client UI with user UI interchange context. They talk in screens, they talk in buttons, they talk in terms that they discovered in walkthroughs, videos, or tutorials, or in training. Then the client UI uh, talks to the backend using UI to service interchange context. It talks in REST terms, like get this resource, post this resource, patch this resource, delete this resource. And then the service talks 
uh, to other services and to the persistence layer in sense uh, using service to server, service interchange context using the main events. And the UI service interchange context, the language between the client UI and the service, it doesn't really care. Nobody really cares about it except for the client and backend developers. So what if we had domain model split in a bad way and UI model split in a bad way? So if client UI and service are so tightly coupled to each other, maybe it would be better to realign the boundaries. Yep. Come on. Nope. So one of the ways that could be done is that we maybe have a thin client on the web or on the native or on the Android uh, that talks to the backend domain model in terms of actions that users carry out. Like customer clicked actually on the screen, create user button, or customer initiated a search with these parameters. And what he gets back in is the search results with specific UI layout, with specific promotions maybe, doesn't really matter. So is this a new concept about thinking or splitting your domain model? Actually, no. Remote desktop connections, where you have a thin client running on your laptop and you connect to the mainframe or to the terminal services. Emacs, you can run an Emacs client on your machine where the server runs on a different machine and you're talking via Emacs specific or project specific UI protocol or even SSH or uh, one example uh, where this actually was implemented in production, but there's only a rumor, there is an Acumatica ERP that uses the same principle. They have this uh, backend talking to the fin clients using domain-specific UI layout, and they receive actions. And this enables some really nice performance, uh, some really nice improvements in the development process. Like what? Again, specifications. If you're able to specify exactly what you expect, like given uh, what you expect from the uh, backend server, which contains the layout logic and the domain logic, let's say we have a ten, uh, bunch of events, like given that was tenant was configured with specific capabilities that, uh, and the capability was task management, given that the tasks were added to the system, and user performs some actions, like in classical given when specification. When user starts a new session, that's how the UI might look like. And similar to the previous specifications, in each then condition, we can specify only the part, part of the UI that interests us. What else can we do with this approach? Simulation. That's not done quite frequently in the industry. Foundation DB, it's like the database that was acquired by the Apple, is a very good example where they did that. And we actually started doing this. What it means that if you have a backend that can run very fast, for instance, at the speed of 600 tests per second, they, then you can simply launch it in a simulated in-memory environment. And then you can start feeding it all sorts of scenarios given a specified ran random seed. For instance, if we're our domain includes the UI logic, the domain logic, and the persistence logic, and we know that we can talk to this domain in terms of user actions, and it will reply us in terms of user layouts, then we can compose a bunch of scenarios based on our understanding of the domain. Like, what if there was a crazy user that was always clicking the first available button that he had on the screen? What if it was crazy user that saw that this field can accept only four characters and he started entering 5,000 characters in that field? And what if, if he repeated that for every single field multiple times? That's what could be done. Or you can actually record user actions, user interactions with the system, uh, the actions that they carried out and the screens that they were presented with and replay them for the debugging. Or you could extend that with property-based testing. If you know that the screen expects certain kinds of inputs, like in the text fields, but what if we start trying different bad combinations of inputs? Maybe something will, find, uh, will be found out. It doesn't cost a lot to try that, simply because you can spin up multiple simulations. 
You can actually spin up virtual clusters of nodes talking to each other to see how they solve concurrency conditions, how they solve race issues, how they solve domain center outages. And that's something that was done before. Uh, we started doing that, and Foundation DB, they were simulating ages of cluster lifetime in a sped up simulated environment. One thing <coughs> that this can do, in addition to enabling simulations, in addition to enabling uh, specifications, it can potentially change the development organization structure. And that was proven by, once again, Akumatica ERP. What they had was the domain model that was served by the domain UI model that was served by the backend server, which included like which components to display on the screen, which actions to accept, and that reacted to these actions. And they had a single developer maintaining both Android and, I feel, if I'm mistaken, uh, iOS applications, because it was just a thin client that was capable of talking with the backend using domain and project-specific UI layout protocol, which means that if a dev backend developer, they had mixed roles now, uh, if they had to roll out a new feature, say a new step in the multi-step wizard, they didn't have to communicate with any of the client teams, client UI teams. They didn't have to touch the web UI. All they had to do is to say, okay, you clicked on this button, now I present you with this screen. This meant that the developers were decoupled or less coupled. The organization scaled. What's more important, uh, this enabled new mode of the organization for this company. Uh, they allowed their partners to add new features to the backend, to the system, to extend it with plugins, uh, creating new, completely new workflows. But these partners didn't have to touch the clients simply because new features were expressed in the existing domain-specific UI language. And it, it just worked. They, you add a new feature, maybe you enable this feature only for a specific customer. Okay, then the backend will return this UI, new UI definition to the native client, and it will display it. So no changes needed. Smaller complexity in the organization structure. Uh, with this approach, the organization can scale a bit further. And that's actually a path to the company-specific app store. So you have a UI layer, you have a domain, uh, so, sorry, you have a domain model, which is uh, exp expressed in events. You have UI model, which is expressed in components and their capabilities and interactions, each maintained by a team. Obviously, like, this separation is, doesn't have to be that way. The, obviously, the team and everybody will have to collaborate in more subtle ways, but these are the primary relations. So if you have your top model and bottom model, you can start developing applications that talk to each other via the domain event model, which maps to the event bus, and that talk to the client application, uh, to the client UI via the domain UI model that maps to the component specifications. So you can start adding new features to your platform. You start adding new uh, types of sessions, new capabilities, screen mirroring, whatever. And it just works. In theory, in practice, there wasn't so much success yet. Uh, so that's that. Uh, this kind of uh, architecture is the crazy part that I promised you. Uh, although I've been, uh, we've started prototyping that on different company. Uh, this architecture went through uh, reviews by QA project managers, UIs, UI developers, backend developers, and they said that it. There are no objections there. Nobody done it before. So there are no, sto no stories of failure, documented stories, and no documented stories of success. Which is weird, because we arrived to this conclu uh, conclusion and to this idea simply by trying to align our software, our model, better with what we understand about the reality, be uh, better with what we think about how customers work with us, what matters to them, what doesn't matter to them. So we, we might be at something new, or we might be at something uh, that is dead end, but it was, it's such a beautiful dead end that everybody hits it and nobody wants to write it, like skeletons in the closet. 
but that's an interesting place to be. And we were able to arrive to that point by trying different design patterns, design approaches, ways to express the main model at different phases of the company's lifetime. And things that worked at one stage, maybe they didn't, before, didn't work before, and they didn't work after. So by iterating, by enabling things that let you iterate faster, quicker, by experimenting, by admitting your own uh, mess-ups, and I had a lot of them. And actually, the first version of the software is based on the biggest mess-up that I had in my development history, look at SecureS framework. But it uh, enabled the business to start, in some extent. <clears throat> so by iterating, by trying new things, by exploring, by sharing, <clears throat> by learning a lot from the others, we were able to move forward and get to that interesting point. And that's what I encourage you all to do. So, the end, and we have some time for questions. Uh, oh, just a second. Who thinks that this is a completely crazy idea that is not going to work? Which one? <laughs> the new separation between the back end and the front end. Uh, I can give you a... I was thinking you said nobody probably did it before. Well, I can tell you one name. Yeah. SAP. Okay. Big success. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> so... Sugar CRM, for example, they, the, the thing is that if you start to generalize something, you get into limitations of generalization, you start to fight your platform mm -hmm. that is allowing you to generalize, <coughs> and user interfaces that are delivered from that are never ideal, never, never, ever ideal. Maybe you will get better success, but it was tried before. So that yeah. was. Uh, that, uh, obviously, this approach, it is not going to work <coughs> for anybody. And it's definitely not going to work uh, for building absolutely generic platform. But what we're here trying to build is uh, just a build a platform that is based on the patterns in a specific project in a specific domain. So the components aren't going to be generic. Uh, these are the components that will bear very tight relationships, a relationship to the model. Like, not just a generic filter with lots of lots of options, but sale ID filter. Not the generic dropdown but warehouse search dropdown. So just trying to reuse the insights we gained from the analyzing domain for, with working in that domain, with spending bathing in that domain for, for years to align the implementation details of that domain slightly better. Probably fail, but what if we succeed? I'll definitely blog about that. <clears throat> okay, so you had a question, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so the details there got a, a bit fuzzy for me. Mm -hmm. um, conceptually, I try to understand, but I, I don't understand how you map like the the domain UI models to the to the main backend domain, uh, and um, how do they communicate? And um, yeah, it raised other uh, ideas <coughs> about things happening in this area like uh, front-end microservices and uh, back-ends for front-ends and all of these ideas that uh, I think are trying to solve the same problem. I wanted to uh, <coughs> explore that a bit. Okay, first of all, <coughs> thank you for a very good question. <coughs> Second, uh, what we're trying to achieve here is that get rid of the UI to service interchange context. That is feels completely superficial at that point. Meaning that API requests with certain JSON structure, with DDOs, uh, that are mapped to API responses with continuation tokens, or with uh, retry later semantic, this kind of stuff. So just like we did before by picking a new boundary service and saying what's inside doesn't really matter. So it doesn't really matter if there are value objects inside. It doesn't really matter if there are aggregates with event sourcing inside, as long as it complies with the specification. So we're trying to increase the boundary covered by this black box slightly to make sure that it hides the layout implementation details. It starts speaking instead of the API language, like RESTful API language, which actually RESTful APIs never really made a lot of sense for me. But everybody is talking, that's why we tried it. However, UI layout APIs is something that feels to be slightly better aligned with the domain, because that's what we 
talk about with the business people. That's what the training people tell us about. And instance, for instance, if we change the web UI, introduce new buttons, then the customer support will probably start coming in and asking, what the hell did you do? Because uh, customers no, have no idea what the button do, does, and they request a new training. That's hours spent in support. <clears throat> so we're trying to reshape the boundary by making sure that instead of uh, REST APIs that talk in JSON and some data objects, uh, we talk in UI objects, in, in UI uh, language. So when the previously service exposed a resource that returned a product or a sale JSON, and you had to do a lot of these requests and map them together on the client side, essentially keeping the UI state on the client and doing a lot of mapping and uh, doing a lot of replication of the server-side logic. For instance, if you know that a sale can't have more than 10 items, you had to do that in the backend where you enforce the rule. But you also had to do that on the client side where you had to prevent customer from adding more than 10 lines into the sale simply because otherwise the server will reject him. So what we're trying to do is to pull all that logic into one place, expand the boundary a little bit. We don't care about the implementation details. We know that there are two things that happen outside the boundary. The, uh, the theme client UI talks to this boundary in terms of things that a user does on the screen, and the view layouts or screens that the user gets in response to his actions. Or maybe these are client-side actions. And we think that by creating this new boundary, we can reuse existing lessons learned uh, from the event-driven specifications and all, uh, to reapply all the benefits getting from using these specifications at a larger scale that might able to help to scale the software further and to scale the organization further by realigning how people are now talking to each other. Thank you, Renaud. That's unfortunately all the time we have for questions. I'll be around, uh, so if you have any other questions, just don't hesitate. And please don't forget the feedback because uh, speakers always want to improve their talks, okay? Thank you very much. Good.